The best thing about standardized tests is the standardization that makes it predictable. In this video, I'm going to share with you five secret techniques that College Board uses to trip you up on the multiple choice section of the AP Biology exam. Hey guys, this is Mikey from AVA Prep Academy, and on this channel, we cover content related to AP Biology. Today, we're not covering any specific chapters, but doing something even better. While there's so much content on the web on the FRQ, the MCQ is mostly hidden away. So I took a peek through the materials that I have and created questions that are uncannily similar to the questions found on the real exam. Not only am I going to show you the questions and how we solve them, we'll explore each of the five common tactics employed by the College Board test makers to make your life difficult. The first trick, wrong substrate, wrong place. What College Board loves to do is to ask you a question about a metabolic pathway or a mechanism. But in doing so, they'll take one particular substrate and ask you its purpose and function. Here, what we see is a question on cell respiration. It reads, which of the following answer accurately describes the purpose of oxygen in the aerobic cell respiratory pathway? A, oxygen is used as the primary donor of electrons at the protein complexes on the mitochondrial membrane. B, oxygen removes electrons from the electron transport chain, forming a water molecule by creating covalent bonds with protons. C, oxygen is pumped into the intermembrane space in order to create a chemoosmotic gradient for the synthesis of ATP. And D, oxygen is an electron carrier that shuttles electrons between glucose and the electron transport chain. Okay, so if you don't know your facts, then you're gonna have a hard time. But you see what's happening here. With oxygen being the final electron acceptor, we know that the right answer is B. But in order to ensure that the remaining choices are wrong, they start sticking oxygen in places where it shouldn't go. Like A, I mean, oxygen is literally named oxygen because it steals electrons, not donate them. C conflates oxygen with protons in making an option that sort of gets the right idea but with the wrong substrate. And lastly, D is confusing oxygen with NADH, again putting the wrong substrate in the wrong place. Now there's no way around it guys, you do need to know some detail. But to be fair, topics like cell respiration, photosynthesis, and gene expression, well you should definitely study them up before you take your exam anyways. Second trick, two-step answer, direction, and reason. Well, here what we see College Board doing is setting up a question that typically requires a direction in its answer. Like for instance, product X will increase or decrease, or the temperature will rise or fall. But since we have four possible answer choices on this test, the rationale that goes with that directionality will either work or not work. So here's an example of that. In an experiment, freshwater protists were moved from its native pond water at time one to a solution containing a high concentration of salt in time two. The following graph was observed. Which of the choices correctly describes the changes observed in ATP usage between time one and time two? A, ATP usage increased when protists were moved to a salt water solution because there was an increase in the net movement of water into the protist, resulting in a greater contractile vacuole activity. B, ATP usage decreased when the protists were moved to a salt water solution because there was an increase in the net movement of water into to the protist, resulting in a greater contractile vacuole activity. C, ATP usage decreased when the protists were moved to a saltwater solution because there was a decrease in the net movement of water into the protist, resulting in a reduced contractile vacuole activity. And finally, D, ATP usage increased when the protists were moved to a saltwater solution because there was a decrease in the net movement of water into the protist, resulting in a reduced contractile vacuole activity. First, the background. We know that freshwater protists find themselves in a hypotonic environment where the solute concentration is lower on the outside and higher on the inside. This also means that water is constantly coming into the protists through those aquaporins. What typically happens is the action of the contractile vacuole, which uses ATP in order to pump out that water that's rushing in. So in this question, when they tell us that we've moved that protist into a high salt condition, we're most likely going to be closer to an isotonic state with less water coming in. This should mean that the influx of water should decrease, resulting in less energy being spent by the contractile vacuoles. So we can clearly see that by figuring out this path of reasoning, the initial direction that we wanna keep is ATP usage decreasing. This means that A and D are instantly eliminated. Now, the rationale is the second step in solving this question. Look, if the protus is indeed in a more isotonic solution than before, we should expect to see a decreasing movement of water into the cell as the two solid concentration become 
closer and closer together, meaning that we should see a decrease in the net movement of water into the cell. This is a very common pattern that we see time and time again. So make sure you solve these questions the easy way. Third trick, three for one, one for all. So with any multiple choice test that has four choices, of which only one is correct, this three to one packaging is very common. This means that they will package three incorrect answers together in one similar theme. In this question, we see that very common type of question called the three for one and one for all, meaning that three of the choices only apply to one specific type of cell, organism, or whatever, while one choice is applicable to a broader group of organisms. Let's take a look. Which of the following describes a process that occurs in all organisms? A, oxygen is used in order to accept electrons from the electron transport chain in the inner mitochondrial membrane. B, glycolysis produces two pyruvic acids while providing a net to ATP to the cell. C, the separation of transcription and translation provides additional regulatory options as the two processes are spatially and temporally segregated. D, random fertilization increases the variability of offspring, ensuring the survival of a genetic lineage. Notice how in this question, the option A only applies to eukaryotic species that have a mitochondria to perform that aerobic cell respiration. C, well, it's the same, only for eukaryotic cells that have a nucleus that can separate those transcription and translation. And D, well, that only applies to sexually reproducing organisms, again, eukaryotic. But B, well, glycolysis is a universal process, so that one is the only choice that applies to all organisms. So three for one and one for all. The fourth trick, DEETS never learned. This is a common trick. Here, what we see are answer choices that are way too detailed for you to have learned in a typical AP classroom setting. Let's take a look. In a population of wrens that overwinter in Northern Canada, changes to feather composition has been observed throughout the season. In summer, much of the thicker plumage is shed, only retaining lighter feathers that keep the birds cool. In the winter, however, thicker plumage returns, allowing the birds to survive over the cold months. Which of the following best describes the mechanism or mechanisms of this phenomenon. A, the cold temperatures alter the genetic code within the genes that regulate feather expression. B, wrens contain special proteins that are temperature sensitive and acts to detach the base of feathers from the skin during warm months. C, temperature can regulate gene expression, resulting in different levels of thickness and feathers at different temperatures. D, viruses that commonly affect wrens in summertime can lead to loss of thick feathers during warm months, an example of mutualism. So here we're dealing with how the environment can influence gene expression, and that's fine. But first of all, A is just ridiculous. We know that the DNA DNA sequence does not change in one's life. We're all born with the sequences that we had at conception, even if we express certain combinations of genes in certain amounts due to external pressures. And B and D are those insane answer choices. Like when would your teacher have taught you about this very specific protein that this one particular species of the wren might have, or some virus that we've never heard of here? It's simply too detailed, and it's details like this that we've never learned. However, in C, we have a much more generalizable answer with gene expression regulation being right there in the answer choice. So when you see questions like this, don't feel like you've missed something in your reading. Chances are, College Board is trying to throw one over your head. The fifth and final trick is missed connections. Here, what we see are all choices that seem fine within the context of the unit or topic being discussed. But that final connection between the answer and the rationale well, it's broken, so let's take a look at that. In two distinct species of mammals, a certain gene product plays vastly different roles. In species A, the protein acts as a regulator of metabolism, while in species B, the protein is involved in bioluminescence. A molecular analysis shows a high degree of similarity in sequence, and the gene is found at the same locus in a chromosome that is structurally similar in both organisms. Which of the following is the best explanation of the different functions played by these proteins in the two species? A. The two genes are molecular homologies that diverge to perform different functions in the two species as a result of divergent evolution. B, the two genes are molecular homologies that now perform a similar function due to convergent evolution. C, the gene demonstrates an example of genetic drift, showcasing the random shifting of the protein's role in these two species populations. D, the two species evolved the genes independently, and it is by chance that the genes have sequence similarities and a shared locus. So this is a fun question that deals with molecular homologies, and each choice stays in its lane. But take a look at B. It all looks fine until we get the words convergent evolution. Look, if the genes evolve from a single common ancestor, as the passage suggests, then we shouldn't be using the word 
words convergent and homologous in the same sentence at all. And C, I don't think we should say anything about randomness, given that we're not told anything about catastrophes or migrations that decrease the population size for either of these species. And D, again, independent evolution resulting in these unlikely coincidences? I don't think so. So A looks pretty good to me. We use the word homologies and how divergences from that common ancestry can result in different functions over time. All right, guys, so these questions were super fun to make, and it actually didn't even take that long. And it's precisely because they were all built with these predetermined techniques employed by College Board. And once you see through this College Board's ruse, you'll also have a very easy time not only creating questions, but solving them too. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed making it. And if you found this content useful, consider subscribing to our channel and liking this video to train that YouTube algorithm to buy me a coffee. This has been Mikey with Able Prep Academy, and we'll see you in the next video.